Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, or an Evangelical Encounters the Restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pinecker, and I'm really delighted to have this awesome all-star panel on Mormon Book Reviews. We love to do these panel discussions and be on the cutting edge of all the scholarly findings we're finding in Mormonism and the, what's going to be talked about at Mormon History Association this June or at John Whitmer or at Sunstone. We get to give preview here all on Mormon Book Reviews, and it's a really exciting space to occupy. And I want to thank uh, my guests all here who have come on. This is a really fascinating documentary that's about to be released, and we're going to preview it here on Mormon Book Reviews for the first time. This will be uh, the conversation to kind of detail what this, uh, I think, revolutionary documentary is. And I and I actually want to talk a little bit about that in a little bit, because I really feel like the, the hypothesis here is really worthy of discussion. So I want to welcome everybody here onto the program. Now, Brandon, you are the producer-director. Welcome to the show, sir. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. Pleasure being here. And we have some talking heads, if you will, in the documentary. Uh, Alex, uh, welcome to the program. How are you doing today? Doing good. Thanks for having me here. And Bryce Blankenagel in the house. This is the second time he's been here. How are you doing, my homie? I'm glad to be back. Congrats on, uh, on your millionth view and uh, all the success MBR has seen. Thank you, Bryce. And by the way, what's uh, what's uh, to tell everybody about your podcast? Uh, yeah, so I do uh, the serialized history of Mormonism. That's Naked Mormonism. And I do a current events show called the Glassbox Podcast with my All right, Shannon Drover. We're going to have to have you back on to talk about your podcast as well. And then the, my guy with the beard. Okay, I was really hoping. I saw the documentary and I was like, man, this guy's got an awesome beard. I sure hope he kept it. Cody in the house. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having us all on. It's, it's, uh, it's nice to talk with you finally. That's great. So yeah, we are waiting for Cody to make his way into the house and he's running up the stairs and he was out of breath when he first came out on the camera. I'm, you're all collected now, right? You, you feel like you're ready to go, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Spring break camp drop off took a little longer. So I was uh, I was in a rush. Okay, we're good now. We're all good. Okay, so I think what we want to do is uh, we're going to show the trailer of this really interesting film shortly. But before we get there, I think we kind of want to set the table here about what got the ball rolling here. And Bryce, you had mentioned you kind of wanted to talk about the con the initial conversation that you and Cody had. So maybe describe that, talk a little bit about that. And Cody, of course, chime in there. And then we're going to talk about how then it broadened out to ultimately making this movie. Yeah, so uh, in my work, I like I communicate history. I do very little research myself. Um, so when I was doing Naked Mormonism and the timeline uh, arrived at the Kirtland Temple dedication ceremony, obviously, as I was reading the primary sources, I'm like, this is this is wild. This is fun. So I made an offhand comment on the podcast that this sounds like it's drugs, right? And myself never having any experience with psychedelics at the time, um, I just kind of made it as an offhand remark um, and just noting that these sound like they're, they're tripping, right? Uh, and very soon after that episode released, I got an email from a listener saying, you have no idea what you're stumbling on here. And, uh, you know, sent me links and uh, some resources and asked if we could meet up. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that sounds great. Uh, he happened to live just uh, uh, in Portland uh, or no, just south of Portland. And I was in Seattle at the time. So it was just a quick drive uh, up. And that's when Cody and I met the first time, and he gave me a copy of Hearts Made Glad by Lamar Peterson, this wonderful little book from the 1970s uh, about uh, the charges of intemperance against the prophet Joseph Smith. And that kind of opened my eyes uh, to the the field that psychedelics may have been in uh, used in the early church. Uh, it was soon after that that Cody uh, sent me a restoration of the Sacred Mushroom, a paper by Robert Beckstead uh, that was uh, presented at Sunstone in 2007. And that's kind of opened my eyes to this as a possibility. And uh, Cody and I um, started working on writing a paper from that time forward uh, that we eventually published, uh, self-published and presented at Sunstone in 2017. So kind of the the 10 year <clears throat> celebration of that initial paper being done by Robert Beckstead. And that kind of uh, forged our working relationship and uh, has led to all sorts of really fun research and discoveries within the field of psychedelic early Mormonism. Well, that's fascinating. Cody, before you chime in, I just want to kind of lay some groundwork here. So there's this idea that maybe psychedelics and uh, other substances might have been used to spike the wine, thus causing there to be visions and hallucinations and stuff like that happening in the Kirtland era and also in the Nauvoo era. This has precedent. This is not uh, without precedent because there are many people who have come up with the hypothesis that in the early first century Christian church, 
that this also was happening. So this is part of a larger mainstream uh, conversation that's happening as well, that it's not, this is not some fringy idea, that the idea that uh, psychoactive substances and different things may have been used in rituals and in magic and in religious practices is a pretty well-established fact. So for those of you who may be uncomfortable with this subject, we do at least look at this as a potential uh, another avenue. Like if there, especially if you want to look for a naturalistic explanation, this might be a good argument in favor of these things. But hey, this still doesn't undermine the idea of supernatural and God existing as well. Maybe Cody, chime in a little bit maybe about your work that you did and, and your conversation you had with Bryce that kind of got this ball rolling. Uh, yeah, it was kind of just the opposite end of that. Uh, I had, I'd started researching, uh, Mormon history because I wanted to write a book, uh, about Joseph and I kind of, I had a plant, uh, history with like plant medicines and psychedelics. And so that was my most, most of my knowledge base and I was studying magic. So, um, I kind of stumbled on the, the Joseph stuff, uh, I, with Robert Beck said his paper and then I hooked up a price and we just kind of got the ball going, um, and kind of much to what you said, I think a lot of a lot of our work has just kind of resulted in trying to recontextualize history that's been lost to us because of the drug war and because of, you know, a number of other things we could go down. Um, uh, but, you know, drugs and, and magic and society, like people have always sought out intoxicants. This isn't a new thing that people started doing in the, in the 19th, 20th century. Um, and just kind of reframing that history back to, you know, we had different language for it back then, but here's how we parse out that, uh, those idioms and whatnot. And kind of, you can hear the drug speak when you, <laughs> when you start to look at it uh, from that lens. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, um, and I do want to tell people too, that, you know, I come from a charismatic Pentecostal background. That's the, 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 the heritage that I come from. I actually, Originally a Dutch Reformed background. My parents got involved in the charismatic new movement in the '60s before I was born. So I was born steeped in this in this religion. So when I read about the early days of the Kirtland Church, it sounds very familiar to me because I've been to those church services. So so for me, it's just kind of fascinating to kind of explore that church because it's like I said, I feel very at home in the in the primitive Mormon church, and 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 so the hearing these stories, it's like wow, it resonates with me. So now, Brandon, uh, and so my lens, see, your lens is like, wow, this sounds like something psychedelic. And in my lens, I'm like, oh, this sounds like something very Pentecostal. But I think it's really important to look at it from different lenses. And I think I think it's really good that, that we're doing having this conversation. Brandon, you're the uh, producer and director of this really fascinating documentary. And I kind of would like just to kind of use the trailer to kind of serve as an introduction. But before we do that, perhaps you have a few words you'd like to say before us watching the trailer. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a whole story where this came about, and I, to explain my story really quick, I grew up fully active Mormon, um, went to BYU, served a mission, got married in the temple, all that, served in a bishopric. Um, I had always been into kind of fringy mystical Mormonism, if you can call it that, with Hugh Nibley and such, and um, through the process of looking into that, trying to tell the story as quick as possible. I uh, started doing guided meditations eventually, and uh, I stumbled upon through this process a video when I was listening to a guided meditation on YouTube from a man named Terrence McKenna. And for those who aren't familiar with Terrence McKenna, I highly recommend you look him up. He talked about psychedelics in a way that I'd never heard before. And through doing that and listening to many, uh, many lectures that he had get given before he died, uh, he died in 2000. I started to recognize that a lot of the language that he was using, and this is why I was a fully active Mormon, uh, was so similar to the language that Joseph Smith and early Mormons would use to describe their psychedelic experiences that I looked it up to see if anybody had done any research on this. And that's where I found the paper that Bryce um, referenced earlier that Cody gave him, uh, which is Restoration of the Sacred, Mu Sacred Mushroom, written by Dr. Robert Beckstead. I read that. I devoured it. I read through all the footnotes. I read the books there in the footnotes and then eventually left the church, not only as a result of this. It was a long process. And it was not until I had my first experience with psychedelic mushrooms that I, the following day, I decided to see if anybody had done more research on this. And this is where I found Bryce and Cody's paper. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I reached out to them. We developed a relationship. Um, I was in the process of moving to Australia. 
I lived there for four years. When I came back to the U.S., I contacted Cody like directly. We developed a relationship, and I talked to Bryce, and I said, well, what if we made a documentary on this? And so that's what we have now. Wow, that's great. So let's uh, cue it up, my friend. Let's check out the trailer. And by the way, folks, this is so fascinating. that We're going to talk about this as you're queuing this up. Uh, did you know there's a Mormon prophet that's part of this story? And it's not just Joseph Smith. It's really a remarkable story. And it involves not only just the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but also other branches of the restoration. So why don't you rewind that to the beginning and let us, and why don't you do full screen too? Um, there yeah, we go. Andrew. Let's do this. There we go. Okay, right. so here we go. We credit Aldous Huxley, Timothy Leary, uh, Richard Alpert as the godfathers of the psychedelic renaissance, which happened in the 1960s at Harvard. But we're reframing that history to happen a generation before in the 1920s, and it's all being funded by a standing Mormon prophet. For me, it actually makes a lot of sense. And I don't think it's a hard bridge between mysticism and Mormonism and psychedelics. Psychedelics and other psychoactive drugs were extremely common within ceremonial magic at the time, the type of magic Smiths did. Datura, mandrake, belladonna, ergots, a whole score of mushrooms. The beautiful Amanita muscaria mushroom. This has a tremendously rich history. And then at night, they would do ritual washings and anointings and behold visions. It was just the tradition that Joseph Smith was raised because that's the way that many people around him understood the world. The Christian Roch Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Plants says even the Mormons have lived and sustained themselves off of the ephedra plant, which is the uh, root for amphetamine, the Brigham tea. There's this nostalgia for history, that, that we had it perfect and we've fallen from grace. And that's Joseph's story. All right. So coming 2024, and we're going to talk about that as well. So, uh, yeah, that's that's quite a... I got that uh, trailer sent to me the other day. And, um, of course, there we go. Okay, it's all fixed. Uh, and I got that, and I was really intrigued. Because, again, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, when you talk about 2007, when this was first proposed, this was kind of a fringy thing, and a lot of academics kind of didn't want to touch this kind of stuff. Over the course of the next decade, decade and a half, we're seeing a mainstreaming of these substances in American culture. And the taboo has really been lifted to for us to actually have these conversations now that we couldn't have 10, 15 years ago. Many podcasters like Joe Rogan and others are talking about this stuff all the time. So it's become more mainstream mainstreamed in America in many ways. And so it's it's a good thing. Now we can have adult conversations about this topic because I think there is some merit to this idea that this kind of stuff could have possibly been happening. And we're just starting to understand the human mind and how it operates and how these substances can activate parts of your brain that, uh, that exist there that, that could account for having these, uh, these uh, hallucinations. But also we have to realize that we don't necessarily need to use those as catalysts, that fasting, repetitive prayer, dancing, all these kind of things can also activate these things as well. So I really think it's it's really important, folks, that, you know, for those of you who are faithful, whether you're a Christian or Latter-day Saint, to, to be open to the idea that this is another possible avenue to the divine that was probably explored by many people, uh, by many of our forerunners and many of our faiths. So what do you say? Uh, uh, maybe talk a little bit about that, Brandon, and then we're going to bring Alex into this conversation. And uh, again, this is uh, this is really interesting stuff. So, Brandon, just maybe uh, talk a little bit about that, and we'll we'll start the conversation. Yeah, I, I'm. This is a fascinating topic, okay, and it's something that one I want to give credit again to Rob, Robert Beckstead, whose name has been dropped a few times. The fact that he wrote this paper in 2007 is a huge deal. This was a time when psychedelics was a bad word in society in general, not just for religious people, and so for him to propose that, which is where all this research came came from since then. And we're in a time now, especially Cody and I live in Portland, where you can basically talk about this openly um, <laughs> anytime you want. It's a different time. And it's and so this is an age when people can talk about this, explore it, and then look at history in a new way where we couldn't have uh, even 20 years ago at all talk about this. So uh, what's fascinating as well is that this research leads to all sorts of other things. Like you mentioned, 
there are other ways. We're not saying that psychedelics were the only way that ecstatic experiences were achieved by the early Mormons. There are other ways that this could have happened, um, almost certainly did. And you can look at the writings of his grandson, Frederick M. Smith, which Cody has researched extensively. You can read his PhD dissertation, which talks specifically about ways to achieve mystical states. But one of those that he talks about in his openly in his dissertation is peyote use and how this can be used to achieve a higher state of revelation. And he used this, um, found this possibly as a result of what his grandfather was doing. Um, and I'd like to turn to you, Cody, if you could talk a little bit more about that, if we do want to go in that direction right now. Uh, yeah. Um... Uh, much uh, to what you were saying, uh, there's a lot of ways to achieve mystical states, especially like visionary uh, states of, of mysticism. Um, I think, a, a, and we're not trying to say that drugs were used every time, all the time, by and all the Mormons. What we're saying is specifically when the Mormons got together in groups and all of them had shared visionary experiences, <laughs> that's that's when we should start really taking a critical eye at like the catalyst involved. And in most cases, it was precluded by a sacrament or some type of anointing ceremony or something that is a catalyst for psychedelic administration. Um, and what I find kind of ironic is that you have Fred M. Smith, who, who start, was talking about this in the 19 teens, 1920s. And a hundred years later, we're just now getting back to the point they were at in the 20s where we can talk about this openly. Uh, we had about a century of just sweeping progressively more and more uh, uh, oppressive drug wars. <laughs> and um, it's led to just, you know, through the 60s uh, up until, you know, the late 1990s, it was almost completely forgotten about um, and just looked at as like a, a, a taboo thing that we don't talk about anymore. Um, uh, and Fred M. Smith uh, was quite revolutionary in his time. He was one of the first generations of psychologists. He, uh, he was rolling around with people at Harvard. He, his, um, his professors were, were rever well respected first generation psychologists. He has PhD dissertation, which does talk about a, a number of ways to achieve mystical states and does highlight a whole chapter on peyote, uh, was devoted in large part as a, a response to uh, William James book uh, about altered states of consciousness. Um, so this was like, a thing that was being thrown around in academia for you know 20 or 30 years before people started looking at it as something you shouldn't talk about anymore um yeah it's fascinating just I, so, I, I just want to clarify too just so everybody understands fred m smith was the prophet seer and revelator of the church reorganized church of jesus christ of latter-day saints the son of joseph smith iii and the grandson of joseph smith and I and we were talking off camera about how, you know, you, it makes you wonder that maybe his interests in this field, there was like a familial echoes of maybe what grandma did or what grandpa did. And and and, and maybe that kind of informed his openness to even, uh, you know, a, a, even advance and address that subject. And, and, and as I recall, Brandon, in the documentary, Harold House Publishers actually was published his dissertation. Is that correct? In, 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 in the church, church publication, which I found I did not know that. Yeah, you can find the publication. You can look it up right now. You could read a PDF of it. It's called The Higher Powers of Man. And in it, he specifically talks about, I think it's maybe 10, about 10 different ways to achieve ecstatic states. And we've listed some of them, fasting, um, meditation, group singing. Um, but then one of them is specifically drugs. And he details his own peyote use. He talks very openly about it in how he used peyote with Native Americans and then talks about how he talked about it openly with his congregation. And so this was just one of the keys to Revelation, and it's inspired by him wanting to achieve access to the keys of Revelation that his grandfather had. And it's not it's not deniable. It's not conspiracy or anything. It's right there. You can read all of it. Yeah, that's true. So he even, he even says it in the book. He's pretty open about it. He's just like, I, I'm a scientifically minded person. I need a reliable method for administering uh, Revelation, visionary Revelation to my congregation. And I'm going to seek all the avenues I can. So I'm. this is my pursuit of study. I need to find the keys that have been lost uh, to Mormonism. Well, and that's the and thing. I'll, I'm just trying to... Uh, Bryce, did you want to say something? Yeah, I want to chime in as well, because one thing that is extra useful about his dissertation, right? So he's prophet from, I think, it's 1916 to 1945, right? So he occupies a very fascinating time of uh, RLDS history and of world history uh, and the evolution of globalization of these religions. Um 
but in it, uh, he uses his lens of, uh, you know, early training as a psychologist uh, in order to describe what he is calling these ecstasies, right? That's the term that he favors as ecstasies. And that's, you know, we, we call it altered states of consciousness. But what is important is that he helps us to chronicle the language that is used uh, in reference to psychedelics uh, at, at kind of a midway point, right? So we have the modern terminology, the, the psychedelic literature and, and the people in the community use today. Uh, but he provides a window of what the, the community was using in the 19 teens and 1920s. And then we can reel all the way back to his grandfather and look at the the way that Joseph Smith was writing about his visionary experiences and early Mormons, not just Joseph, were writing about their revelatory and visionary experiences. And we can see kind of like a consistent thread of the evolution of the way of the, the, the humans use language in order to describe these visionary experiences. So there's a lot of utility and historical usefulness about his, uh, his uh, dissertation. Uh, and notably as well in that book, he also laments how the increased policing efforts are as uh, oppressing the Native Americans who are using peyote. And this is at a time when peyote wasn't illegal, uh, as it is today. This is pre-war on drugs, right? He's writing this in 1914. Um, but it does highlight the cultural tendencies of uh, people uh, who there's there's the upper class uh, drugs and then the lower class drugs. And peyote was one of these that was used by Native Americans. Therefore, it was seen as one of the lower class drugs, uh, whereas, you know, oftentimes opium or you know other drugs were seen as kind of the higher class, the more um, elective society will use those ones. Uh, so it reveals the tensions, the, the cultural tendencies uh, and kind of the, the way that uh, people have viewed drugs at the time um, and helps us kind of inform uh, the way that or the the cultural tendencies that led to the uh, you know the decrees of the war on drugs that led to the legal prohibitions against these these uh, plant medicines yeah i think that's fascinating a good good history lesson there too bryce and then i think also just looking and there has to be another echo going on in fred's mind too is that he believes probably that the native americans are lamanites talked about in the book of mormon and that he would think that perhaps Nephites and Lamanites, they're, the way they were able to access visionary experiences, including Lehi, perhaps were using these Native American practices. In his mind, he thinks he may have been thinking he was also tapping into what the practices of the peoples of the Book of Mormon were doing as well. And uh, before we, I want to move, move on to Alex, but was there anything else we wanted to address about Fred Smith before we started talking about the magic worldview that Joseph Smith grew up in? So many things, uh, but no, we should we should move on. We can okay. I can do this hours on Fred M. Sure. I mean, sure. I mean, one thing that we should mention we can't go into it right now. It's going to take too long. But Fred M. Smith is directly tied to Harvard and the psychedelic rev revolution that happened at Harvard. Can't say that he's the sole cause of it or anything, but there is verifiable um, writings that show that he was supplying peyote to people at Harvard. And there are specific individuals. I'll drop drop the name in Virgil Thompson if you want to look into it. It's an interesting subject to look into. But well, at the beginning of the trailer, we got to point out that, you know, uh, Cody says that, you know, uh, psychedelic research was happening at Harvard underground 40 years prior to what we call the psychedelic revolution in the 60s and 70s. So we've got a link right. to that. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you do talk about that in the documentary as well. So that might be a good introduction point for that. So, Alex, you know, what's so fascinating is you know, your background you know, we, we, let's talk about the world that Joseph Smith grew up in. OK, so they're in one sense, they're kind of evangelical Christian, second great awakening products, people. But then there's also within the rural context of uh, using divining rods and, and, and magical instruments. And I always try to parallel this with my grandfather, who grew up in Western Canada in the 1920s, Calvinist Christians, and they used dowsing rods. And my grandfather in the 1950s started one of the largest plumbing supply companies in the Midwest. And for years, they'd have their calendars and all the calendars had astrological symbols in them because all the farmers used this astrology. Now, if you got calendars from my from that plumbing company, it would be with Bible verses in it. But back in the day of the original, <laughs> our primitive Christianity also is kind of magical as well. So, Alex, I want you to talk a little bit about the world that they grew up in and how some of these psychoactive plants would have just been part of daily use uh, at that time. Yeah, so there's two different facets to this. Uh, there's the sort of occult world that Joseph Smith and his family grew up in, but then there's also, you know, Joseph's extended family and uh, their approach to plants and herbs as well. Um, so I guess we can start out with the magic stuff, but um, yeah, Mike Quinn, seminal work, you know, early Mormonism and magic worldview. 
has these brilliant ties linking Joseph Smith to all of these different magical practices, you know, treasure digging um, and using these divining rods. He was functioning as a seer. And uh, P.D. Newman has done some really great work tying uh, early Rosicrucianism with psychedelic substances. So, you know, when Joseph and his family would go out and do these treasure digs, Joseph, as the virgin scryer, would function as sort of the medium between the spirits and the diggers. And P.D. Newman talks about, and th this can be found in like John Dee's journals um, in Enochian magic, that they were using sort of these fumigations that were containing psychoactive substances, uh, the nightshades, henbane, belladonna, datura, and they would use these to be able to, you know, communicate with the spirits and to be able to know exactly what was going on to sort of thin the veil a bit. And th so this was common throughout, you know, all of these different magical practices. And it's in the magical texts that the Smiths were working with, you know, Edward Sibley's, um, Ebenezer Sibley's book has whole uh, slew on herbs of psychoactive herbs. I think it explicitly mentions uh, Belladonna and Henbane and Datura as ways to work with the spirits, you know, um, and they were under similar astrological signs. And then um, Cornelius Agrippa, who was the, the sort of the, um, what's the right word, uh, inspiration for Francis Barrett's The Magus, um, explicitly talks about the use of the psychoactive herbs in magical practices. And this was common in folk magic in uh, the early United States as well, um, both medicinally and in these magical practices. Um, I've been doing a lot of work on trying to figure out, you know, how just how prevalent these substances were within um, cultural usage, within rural usage, and even within, you know, the medical establishment. And this is one part of my research that I think is really interesting, is that Datura was one of the most commonly used medicines at the time for both like epilepsy and uh, rheumatism or arthritis. And it was used sometimes they they do experiments with like blindness and it was a, a, a pain cure. And so it was incredibly common among, you know, the, the doctors in the late 1700s, early 1800s. There's hundreds of treatises on it and stuff. And so this, this ties into Joseph's family because... Um, what I, I think is going on is with uh, Solomon Mack, so Lucy's father. You know, he's this devout atheist, um, fights against Christianity for most of his life. However, he also has uh, develops epilepsy after he has trees fall on his head three different times, which is wild where the chances, right? Um, but he writes in his autobiography that during uh, a winter when he, when he was older, he had he was under treatment for rheumatism. So he was likely being treated with Datura because it also would, would have helped with the epileptic seizures. But what he specifically mentions, you know, while I'm under treatment for this, I started having these dreams and these visions of these, these lights coming towards me. And he, he has sort of all of the symptoms of somebody who's being treated with Datura. And it, Datura is most likely to cause all sorts of visions and sort of derealizations and not realizing that you're actually hallucinating at the time or having a vision. Um, and it's after this experience that Solomon Mack actually converts to Christianity and becomes like this, this devout Christian. And I think it's largely because of, you know, his treatment from rheumatism with the Torah. And th this links to the sort of the broader great uh, second great awakening, because if something like the Torah is being used to treat all of these different um, ailments, you know, if somebody's dosing with that, on Saturday night, say, or Sunday morning prior to going to church, Datura can last anywhere from three days to a week. Um, there are certain methods that you can speed it up so it only lasts a day. But if they're dosing with that, you know, Saturday night and then going to church Sunday morning, they're already in this prime state to have visionary experiences. And so whatever, you know, the pastor's saying might resonate with, with them way more than it normally would kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I want to hone in on Datura very specifically because this is one of this is one of our prime candidate uh, entheogens. And right, we we've explored various uh, family of fungi, uh, and uh, and that's in the form of Amanita muscaria, Slosophy mushrooms, uh, uh, ergot. Uh, so, uh, but there there's also this whole industry of of plants that uh, are hypothesized, and we kind of hone in on Datura specifically because the Joseph Smith Senior Dream. Uh, one of 
of his um, seven dreams, five of which are recounted by Lucy Mack Smith after the death of Joseph Smith in her uh, biographical sketches. Uh, it describes a detour tree perfectly, uh, and it speaks of him eating the seeds, and that's when he has uh, his visionary experience, right? Uh, so, and 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 that is captured within the beginning of the Book of Mormon as well. Is this 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 visionary experience is very similar to the vision that Lehi had, that then Nephi had. Uh, and we see that tendency that, you know, Joseph Sr. has this visionary experience, likely because of a detour tree. Then Joseph Smith goes out into the woods and has a similar experience and then founds the religion, right? <clears throat> uh, but detour specifically has uh, this amnesiatic effect where you can uh, be, you can consciously agree to take a dosage of detour and you will experience the symptoms and the toxicology of detour and have absolutely no recollection that you dosed yourself, that you even agreed to dose, or you will not have the the, the realization that you are under the influence of Datura until it's waning hours, until it's it's falling off. And there's uh, well, very psychedelics perform in different ways. And one thing that Datura often does is it essentially augments your reality. It creates a visionary hallucin hallucinations um, in a world around you, whereas it's much more common for things like mushrooms to create entire visual patterns and and, and tracers and fractal colors. Uh, whereas Datura itself, you can be uh, sitting and interacting in the world um, and it just is slightly augmented. You're talking to a person who isn't there, but everything else is totally real around you. Um, if you look on erawid.org, uh, that has, you know, that's a great repository of people who share their experiences, many of them anonymously because many of these substances are illegal. But um, uh, a, a, a numerous individuals who use Datura will, um, they'll, they'll go and watch TV and uh, realize a couple hours later that the TV wasn't even on, right? So it has, the, like, Datura has this augmenting reality effect, and and it contributes, uh, you know, part of uh, what you were referencing earlier, Alex, with Ebenezer Sibley and Agrippa and Barrett, then talking about fumigating nightshades, which Datura is a member of the nightshade family, uh, that it, it conduces to the, uh, to soothsaying and to prophecy and to the ministration of spirits. Because these are the most likely class of, of drugs that you can partake that allow you to sit in a room where everything else seems fairly normal, but you can hallucinate a person walking through a congregation and be, you know, in your suggested state of suggestible state of mind, you can be convinced that you just watch John the Baptist walk through the congregation uh, or the Savior himself. Um, and I, I reference these things because these are very explicit accounts that are made in the uh, as part of the School of the Prophets and part of the Kirtland Temple dedication ceremony that Datura uh, toxicology uh, maps very accurately to what they experienced in the early church. And we should point out that there's like historical precedent for this too. I mean, they found Datura residue, henbane residue, belladonna residue in the, where in the temples of Delphi, where the oracles would, you know, where you would go to find out what was going on in the spirit world or what the gods were doing, whether or not you're going to succeed. They found it similarly, you know, in Egyptian chalices um, and it's, it's found all over, you know, ancient Europe. So these there's precedent for using these substances to augment reality and interact with something that quote unquote isn't there. Mm. And that's that's not to say that um, these were like all magicians were using drugs. Uh, this is more to say that this was just another thing in their magical toolkit. In the same way that most magicians have chalk and a sword and a, like, they have magical objects they use in ceremonial magic. Um, and, and it was so, so common amongst magicians that you even have writings like uh, Abramel and the Mage, when describing a, uh, an, a, a flying ointment, says that, like, I'm not going to waste the page space giving you this recipe, because if you're reading this book, you know how to make ointments like this, which is, assumes that it's prevalent enough that, like, this is just common knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow. So, uh, I, I am... I mean, we could go so many directions in this conversation. There's, my mind is just uh, rolling and it's, wow, it's amazing. But I, I wanted to talk maybe a little bit, Brandon. Um, so you have experience in, uh, I guess this is the first time you've actually made a a film or a documentary. And, and just so people understand, this is kind of like almost like a proof of concept that you're trying to do. You would actually like to expand this yeah. out to be a much broader 
series, maybe maybe something on Netflix or something like that. So maybe talk a little bit about what your plans are with this documentary and also talk about how you're going to be doing some screenings uh, next month, perhaps in April. Now, today is uh, March 25th. Um, we're, we're, the, we're, we've talked off camera about the possibility about maybe doing this at a larger venue while you're out there too. Well, that's all to be determined and we can, we'll just stay tuned to Mormon book reviews and we will update you on any changes there. Let me just talk about a little bit about what you're, what you what you want to do with this film and, and how, how you want to proceed from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what you just heard Alex, Cody and Bryce talk about it, as far in depth as they went was just scratching the surface. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Um, what we have in our documentary is a 40 minute introduction for somebody that knows nothing about the subject. Okay. So it just tells you a little bit about, um, what the basis of this theory is a little bit about where it would have been instituted, where the strong evidence is a little bit of conjecture, but also just an introduction to Mormonism in general for somebody that doesn't know anything about Mormonism. So we're trying to appease both people that have been born into the faith and the people that don't know anything about Mormonism with a topic that's like, what are you talking about? You've never, I've, the idea of Mormons using psychedelics. So this is a big topic to uncover. So we have a 40 minute documentary. There's a proof of concept. Our goal is to make a full length docu documentary or have a multi-part series on this. And we um, have finished this as a proof of concept to get a conversation started with a streaming service or with an agent to try to get this going somewhere. And uh, as part of the promotion, we are having two screenings. We have a screening in Portland that's upcoming on May 11th. And you can find out more on our website, which is searstonedproductions.com, searstonedproductions.com. And you can get tickets on the website, order them for Portland or for Salt Lake. We also have a weekend of screenings, the weekend of April 27th and 28th in Salt Lake. Um, there will be four screenings at... It's a smaller venue. The one in Portland is at a movie theater. The venue in Salt Lake is a very cozy spot, which you will see in the documentary. It's called Natural Law Apothecary. And so we are almost out of tickets. We have about 10 tickets left to that weekend of screening. So um, we will likely make more tickets available. Um, not many, probably a max of 20, but we'd love for anybody to go searstoneproductions.com, learn more about the film, learn more about um, the subject, see the trailer and get tickets for it. All right. Thanks, tickets guys. are free, by the way. Okay. That's anyone's... true. Tickets are free. It helps. Yeah. We're going to have links in the description um, for that, uh, for the website, for those of you who want to check that. So now I I, uh, I want to ask all of you, actually, I'm going to ask you all a question because I think a lot of people are probably wondering this. And if you don't want to answer the question, you have every right not to. But I just want to ask about each one of you, uh, your faith background, like what your faith background was and where you're, where, if you have a faith or lack thereof. Uh, or what your eth ethical system is. Maybe just just talk a little bit about where you're at. And if you don't want, to, if you're not comfortable answering that question, uh, but uh, let's start. Who who's that? Who wants to answer that question first? <laughs> All right, Brandon. I, I've I mean I've I've talked a fair amount already. I mean I love talking about this topic. Um, because even for me, I don't know exactly where I stand. You know, and I know that that's not trying to avoid the answer. It literally isn't. It's because I have a battle on myself every day. Not a battle. It's kind of just a kind of dance with it every day. Um, so I was born into the faith. My dad's side goes back to Charles Seabridge, who was a early apostle. I think 1833 is when he joined the church. My mom was a convert. Um, so I, yeah, go far back in the faith, grew up in the Bay area. I'm not from Utah, but fully practicing Mormon went on a mission. Um, like I, like I said, uh, got married in the temple, went to BYU, but I, I did have severe doubts going back to teenage years. And I dealt with it quietly for the most part, opened up to um, before I got engaged. I, I mentioned this to 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 my girlfriend at the time. And and uh, so but other than that, it kept it pretty quiet. Um, and so it was always gnawing at me. And it really wasn't until I found out about the potential psychedelic origins of Mormonism. that I found something that satisfied me in the faith. Oh, this makes sense of a lot of things with Mormonism. And so although it led me out of the faith, and this also came as a result of my wife having a faith crisis at the time, we ended up leaving together, um, that I was able to explore Mormonism in a way that I never had before, that was more comfortable for me. Now, I didn't take, I, I, I have left the faith. I'm no longer on the records of the church. However, Mormonism is still my spiritual language. You know, it's a lot of things that whenever I'm introduced to a new concept, whatever it is from 
from a theological point of view or a new new uh, spiritual concept, I still frame it, use the framework of Mormonism to test it. And I still use that language when I talk to other people. I still um, am fascinated. It's still my drive to to find out about spiritual matters, um, if you want to say it that way. But I'm not I'm not involved in the faith. And I also am not uh, mm, I grew up in the Latter-day Saint faction of Mormonism, and I'm not uh, necessarily a proponent of the current state of the Latter-day Saint faith. However, I love early Mormonism and I can't get enough up until about the death of Joseph Smith. OK. All right. Uh, who's up next? Cody? Turn your microphone on. Sure. sure. <laughs> um, I grew up LDS. Uh, my family are still practicing uh, members. I left when I was uh, I, I was checked out when I was about twelve. But uh, I was I, I officially left at seventeen and a half or so. It was like the last six months of being a kid, so I just stopped going. Um, uh, I I suffered from chronic migraines my whole life. Uh, I'd be like go blind. I could have seizures, um, and I had them quite frequently. Um, uh, when I was about uh, almost nineteen, um, I was at a party. I had a friend give me LSD, and it was two really major things happened in my life. Uh, I had my first full blown visionary experience. I was like, "This is the Holy Ghost. Holy, this is what they've been talking about." Um, and then I also went four months without an episode, a migraine episode. Uh, so that, that like drove me into psychedelic research. Um, Cause I was like, what, what is this? I thought this was like hippie nonsense. This was just supposed to be fun at, at a party. Uh, uh, and so my, um, the evolution of my kind of spiritual journey has been a lot of uh, magic. A lot of, I find ceremonial magic, my own, Kind of making to be very helpful uh psychedelics help facilitate parts of that but not all of it so i do a lot of magic where i don't use drugs <laughs> um uh, and honestly not very often do i ever incorporate uh them unless i really need to um i am kind of adamantly agnostic on <laughs> what the reality of these experiences are i it doesn't really matter to me it, more of a question of like what kind of change is it initiating in your life like what are the real tangible things it's initiating um and i found it to be very beneficial I, i'm uh I, if i'm going to preach psychedelics uh, used properly i found them to be um they, they they've been described as like 30 years of psychotherapy in a night and if you use them appropriately i i found them to be about as effective uh uh so yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, a big proponent that's of psychedelics, and I don't know really know what's happening. Huh, that's really wild, you know. And and one of the things, and we'll, we'll continue with this, but you know, one of the things that really struck me is as I was listening. To, this was probably like seven, eight years ago, and I'm listening to Joe Rogan, and they're describing. And he's having all these people on talking about psychedelics, and this that's the first time I ever really kind of even look took it seriously. And as people would describe the experiences they have, it sounded a heck of a lot like born again experiences in our faith tradition. Sounded very Pauline. Sounded a lot, a lot like Paul's life changing experience, life altering experiences. We have people like like one, like psychosyllabin. People do microdoses or psychosyllabin, and and they're hardcore smokers. And next thing you know, they just walk away from smoking. I mean, it's it's almost like a religious experience. And so that's what really struck me was. This sounds all too familiar and it really kind of helps make sense of a lot of what's going on in these, like when you have, you know, you do, I look, it, being part of the born again experience tradition, there are people who come into the church, their lives are a mess and then they have this experience and they go in a different trajectory. That just does happen. And we do see a similar thing happening with people who do substances. Uh, Bryce, talk to that and also talk about your faith background. Well, I think that uh, the way that you contextualize it is putting the cart before the horse because you call it that the, these people are having these religious experiences. I disagree with that. They are having spiritual experiences that sure, have been that, yeah. that many uh, that we have termed as religious experiences, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's important to note that like the ritualistic practices, uh, the use of, of intoxicants uh, for elevated and altered states of consciousness 
predate organized religion, right? It's just that religion happens to, uh, in many ways, uh, have a cultural stranglehold on the terminology we use for spiritual pursuits. And, you know, and, and I, I think that there's, there needs to be kind of an upsetting of history and the way that we use these words because these spiritual practices and pursuits are, are far more, in my opinion, far more worthwhile and you get a lot more out of them, especially on a personal level than, uh, than any religion is going to lead you to. Um, and, and that kind of, uh, that's kind of my, my walk in life. Right. So like I grew up born in the covenant. I told my story, uh, in, in the, in the online space a thousand times, but, uh, for myself as an agnostic atheist, redundant as it is, um, this allows me an opportunity to achieve spiritualism without having to engage in religious rituals, without putting a gatekeeper in between me and a spiritual experience, um, that, that, that this is uh, accessible through naturalistic means, and it is ubiquitous. It is nearly ubiquitous that, you know, anybody, whether, whether they are an atheist or a born-again Christian, the two of those individuals can sit in the room and dose together and have a similar spiritual experience. Uh, just uh, shows the utility and importance of spiritual pursuits. And and we as pattern seeking individuals, we need ritualism. We need spiritualism uh, to survive as a culture, as a species. Um, and this is a way that we can access those things without their necessitating a like a belief proposition i don't have to believe in god to have a spiritual experience and i i think the more people that can begin to grasp that the more people can realize that um it can it can shake people out of an orthodox mold where their spiritualism has been so pigeonholed into um, like in our tradition of like you go to church you you take the sacrament you do your calling you do all these things the legalism the bureaucracy of spiritualism pulls you further away from actual spiritual pursuits it's busy work right um, but uh, reframing this idea that that is not uh, spiritualism that that is just legalism um, it can hopefully break people out of that mold and begin to disassociate their sense of god away from their religion which i think the religion uh is is really kind of the 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 crux of the issue here and the kind of the forefront of the the a friction that is caused, especially when we have subversive ideas like psychedelic history coming up. Fascinating. So Alex, so tell us a little bit about your your faith background and where you're at now. Yeah, so I grew up Mormon, about as Mormon as you can get. I was Peter Priesthood, whatever, all of that, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, and I actually had my first psychedelic experiences while I was still an active uh, member. Um, I I've suffered from depression, anxiety, my entire life, uh, treat, treatment resistant. I'd gone through the whole slew of antidepressants and nothing was working. And I was seeing a psychiatrist while I was at BYU and he's like, Hey, there's this thing called ketamine. Like, do you want to try that? We can try that next. If you want. I'm like, Hey, I will try anything at this point. Like, let's do it. I had no idea what it was. And he kind of primed me a bit. And I was like, Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Let's try that. And had a many ketamine experiences after that that just blew my mind and at that time you know even prior to that i'd been interested in you know other mythologies and other pantheons and whatnot and i've kind of since i became an adult i've taken seriously you know joseph's proposition that you know mormonism is truth wherever it is you know all of it fits within mormonism and so for me you know the these psychedelic experiences represent spiritual experiences um it was just a couple sessions in that i started having extremely lds style vision imagery you know um resembling you know the first vision and other visionary experiences of the early mormonisms and i was like like what what's going on like and that's that's how i got interested in the theory actually is i started having visions of my own that resembled it it was like okay well maybe they were doing something similar um yeah and so I'm I'm pretty cosmopolitan in my beliefs now. You know, I think the Book of Mormon is a book of scripture. I think the Quran is a book of scripture, the Upanishads, the Vedic texts, you know, all of that. And I'm also a practicing magician like Cody. Um, and that informs a lot of sort of my worldview as well. And so I kind of, you know, I I I, I don't view, you know, the church as having this sort of soul, um, uh, what's the word 
they don't have the only truth, you know, I think that there is some truth in there. And I, like, I respect the hell out of Joseph Smith and what he did and the theology he, he developed. And it's very reminiscent of, you know, other theologies as well that, um, like it's very platonic and stuff. And I, I've always found Plato fascinating. Um, yeah. So I, I'm very cosmopolitan in all of this and kind of see all of this as sort of pointing to the spiritual nature of many of the experiences in psychedelics, although that not every psychedelic experience is spiritual and not every spiritual experience has to incorporate psychedelics right. for sure. Okay. Well, so you mentioned you and Cody are magicians. What, when you say you're a magician, what, what kind of a magician are you, uh, Alex and then Cody? Yeah. So, I mean, like Cody, I work with ceremonial magic. I follow some of the texts. Um, I, I follow kind of just, I guess, chaos magic is what it's called. You know, I kind of pick and choose from different uh, systems to develop rituals, to have, specific outcomes happen, you know, work with spirits, um, and work with other forces and whatnot. So. Yeah. Okay. Co Cody, share, share with us your, I mean, cause when I think of magician in the modern context, I'm thinking of, you know, uh, Houdini and people that the top hats and rabbits out of hats, uh, but Cody, maybe describe your, your, your practice of magic. Uh, similar to Alex's, um, I, I am a, I use a bit of everything. Um, <laughs> I I pick and choose and I borrow from everyone. Um, I think a lot of magic is intention, uh, setting intention, activating intention and manifesting it. Um, and so whatever resonates with you, um, I, I don't begrudge anyone who wants to learn a system like Enochian, but I personally don't have time to spend 20 years researching this. So I'll you know, take a little bit here, a little bit there, um, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I, like Alex was saying, you you kind of design ritual to make certain things happen. Uh, and once you've studied a few of these books, it's, it's pretty easy to figure out kind of, it's like algebra. It's like you're just replacing variables and that equals this. And if you set your intention right, it's pretty hard to mess up. Uh, uh, I think it's it's not as nefarious as some, especially some Mormons and evangelicals might think it is. <laughs> okay, I, yeah, I think it's important enough. to point out too that you know, uh, magic is. It, I mean, it, it's got this negative connotation, even worse than like psychedelics do still. Um, but you know, for a Mormon audience, like priesthood is essentially indistinguishable from magic. You know, priesthood's calling on God's power and using that to enact change in the world. Magic is just you doing the same principle. I mean, so much of magic in the Middle Ages was all under the guise of this Christian magic, you know, with God at the hierarchy, they would, they would work with, you know, the archangels, Michael, Gabriel, whatnot, Raphael and whatnot, and use that to, you know, bind demons or bind other spirits to affect change in the world. And so the priesthood, in essence, you know, you're working with God to enact some sort of change. You have an intention when you're giving a healing blessing. And it's, it's the same sort of altered state kind of flow principle within magic as well that is the same as when you're giving like a priesthood blessing and whatnot so okay. you know it, it's imbuing and in the same way you know blessing the sacrament is imbuing this like special properties to the bread and water which were just previously just bread and water you're consecrating it to something else it's the same way with magic you know you're consecrating different tools that you work with to to serve a certain purpose like consecrated oil so it's not it's not like this nefarious sort of system. It's it's just a sort of removed system outside of necessarily religion proper. It's it's a system that religions use as well. Okay, now but I I want everybody to start thinking of anything that we haven't covered yet in this conversation that you want to bring to the table. Start thinking of those things. But Brandon, what I would like for you to talk about is the location. One of the key sites that you did your interviews at was Gilgal Gardens. Now. I remember uh, the first time I flew into uh, Utah, I was going to the first Mormon History Association I've ever been to, and Rick Bennett was picking me up at the airport. And Rick goes to me and says, Steve, do you want to go see the Sphinx? And I'm like, the Joseph Smith Sphinx? He's like, yeah. So, yeah, that was the first stop. And for, I think we did Crown Burgers, and then we went and saw the Joseph Smith Sphinx, okay? And and, and what's so funny is that probably 90 to 95% of Latter-day Saints and people who live in Utah have no idea that this is located in downtown Salt Lake City. And some of you talk about that choice of a venue and really kind of how cool and awesome of a site it really is. Yeah, I mean, we, we went through all sorts of locations when we were planning this. When we shot the documentary in two days, yeah, but Cody and I had been 
had calls every day for about four or five months where we were planning this thing. Okay. So we had almost every minute of this two days planned out. And at one point we were planning on going to, or looking at the idea of going to multiple locations. Kennecott mine was one of them that we're going to shoot at. We're going to shoot um, at the point in the mountain. At one point we're going to shoot near temple square, but then we made the decision. Gilgal gardens was going to be one of them. We were just going to shoot in front of the Sphinx. I didn't know what it was. I, I I lived in Utah for four years. I didn't even know that it existed. I can't even remember who first put it into my mind that it was out there. I'd seen an image of the Joseph Smith Sphinx before in a Google image search. And I was like, what is that? Anyway, so Cody in the end, after going back and forth, he's like, let's, let's use our time as best as possible. Let's just shoot everything there. We went to the city. We got permission to shoot there. And um, so we shot at different locations within the Gilgal Gardens. And before before we shot, Bryce, while we were setting up camera, took me around the Gilgal Gardens and he walked me through an interpretation of what was happening in the gardens. And and then we chose three spots, largely based on what, what Bryce um, pointed out while he was giving me the tour of the gardens. We chose three locations to do the interviews. So they're very thought out. When you watch the documentary, pay attention to what's in the background. Look at it. This is not accidental. And uh, it has to do with the themes that we're talking about and the subject matters that we're talking about in the documentary. It is not a coincidence. Okay, look very closely at the background. Bryce? Uh, I just want to uh, kind of um, echo that point, right? Like, one thing that's great about the Gilgal is, right, like, it has the surface level that everybody knows about that knows about Gilgal Gardens. And that's the Joseph Smith Sphinx, right? Like, that's a, that's a prominent feature. You walk in, it's one of the big things that you see there. But much if we can use that as a microcosm of mormonism in general right it's everything else around the feature that contextualizes the feature that is just as important as the feature itself and like that's a part of why we chose gilgal is because there's like what everyone knows but there's so much hiding underneath the surface that you just have to look a second longer before you begin to realize oh there's actually an entire narrative being told here there's an entire hidden story that was not available to me before and i kind of want to use that to springboard into my, an overall point is that like i subscribe to the like the what used to be the byline of sunstone which is more than one way to mormon right if the rusty church wants to abandon the moniker of mormon then fine people like me you're going to pick it up and use it and at the end of the day i am a mormon it is my language it is my spiritual language as well uh even as not a spiritual person uh it, because when you see uh when you uh you know stop paying attention to the big features and that's you know mormon quirkyisms and you know oh mormons don't drink coffee or tea once you get past that and look at the story that lies underneath that you know once you stop missing the forest for the trees you realize that there's much more to the story and that there's more of a culture and heritage to embrace here than just the bureaucratic going to callings and doing everything that the church wants you to do and that's part of why i think that gilgal ended up being one of the best places that we could or that that w was decided to shoot this and i'm glad that brandon and cody did decide on it because there is a, every angle you look there there is something about the esoteric origins of mormonism that you need to spend time looking at the features at the sculptures there to appreciate what the artist was trying to tell people who are going to you know who are going to tour it after his death and i think in many ways uh that's the mark of a good artist is is laying hidden meanings within uh the, what they produce to the world and i think in many ways there's a way to look at what joseph smith left behind as quite a a large orchestration of a huge art piece right in many ways uh mormonism was subversive of the culture and the the christian culture at the time and the orthodoxy of christian culture at the time and uh, and it wants to encourage this sense of personal revelation and uh, personal ministration and connection with deity. And that is always going to be subversive to organized entities. And I think that there's nothing more Joseph Smith than striking out on your own and seeking your own cultural and, and spiritual pursuit, even if you're doing so within the larger context of a culture that you were born and raised in. Well, great, great uh, uh, words there, Bryce. I really appreciate that. It was very useful. Um, yeah. So Alex and Cody, uh, you guys got a couple of things you want to add on to this conversation before we wrap it up? Alex first. Or Cody, you go first. That's fine. You, you turn your microphone on first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I 
I don't really have a whole lot. To, to, I mean, we could talk. We could pick any one of these points and talk about it for an entire episode. Uh, um, but check out the trailer. Try and make it to a screening. Um, yeah, nice. just uh, if you find this interesting, you could spend years just diving down rabbit holes. So I, I would. Uh, I definitely think we'll have you guys, some of you guys back, all of you guys back in different formats to kind of continue this conversation. So anything we didn't get covered today, we'll make sure they get covered here. Alex, uh, was there any final points you'd like to make? Yeah, I just want to reemphasize the fact that, you know, this theory isn't meant to undermine anything that Joseph did or any of his visions. It's not, we're not trying to prove, oh, this gotcha that Joseph, oh, he was just doing drugs. So we can, you know, ignore everything he said. No, that we're just looking at one possible explanation for why, like, Mormonism is so interesting and so incredible and why what Joseph did was so incredible with these visions. So the goal, the goal of all of this isn't to sort of disprove anything of Joseph. We're just trying to, you know, understand how these visions happened and why they were lost and, you know, why so many people and more, a lot of active Mormons today included are so interested in, you know, the visions that psychedelics are producing. Right. I love it. So Brandon, uh, the producer, the director, uh, of this interesting film documentary is coming out. Maybe you want to have a few final words you'd like to say. Again, just reunifies with there's just a handful of tickets left. Um, there are going to be links in the description. They are free. And uh, and and then, of course, we'll maybe see about getting this, uh, uh, expanding this to other venues at some point as well. But right now we know what we know. Maybe talk a little bit about that. And then any final words you'd like to share? Yeah. Um, this is really kicking off a bigger project. That's what this is. This is not the final thing. So we have a 40 minute documentary that is a proof of concept. If you watch that, you're going to be introduced to the subject. Okay. And you, you can, you can go all sorts of places from there, but really our goal is to make something bigger. And so full length documentary, a multi, multi-part series of what we're really looking at. And we love to hear from you and you can go to our website, seerstonedproductions.com and contact us. Um, so yeah, tickets available weekend of April 27th and 28th in Salt Lake. And then May 11th in Portland. Portland will be an actual movie theater, Salt Lake, a smaller venue, like I mentioned before. Tickets are almost gone for Salt Lake, so go get them. If we sell out, we have a way to make a few more tickets available, but not many. Um, and if there's huge demand, we're looking at the possibility of playing it at a bigger theater in Salt Lake. But our goal really isn't to make this a theatrical release. We want to just make a bigger project that is as viewable to people in their homes as possible. Um, so that's that's what we're looking at doing. And it's uh, exciting times. So love to connect if anyone wants to reach out. That's great. All right. Uh, Bryce, anybody else have anything else they'd like to say before we wrap this up? Just, of course, thank you to MBR, Steve, uh, for inviting us on, allowing us an opportunity to talk about it and talk about the obviously, importantly, the path forward, right? Like this is this is one stepping stone on a larger project. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful that I've been a part of this project uh, since its inception uh, and been dragging me along the way. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed putting it together. And thank you, Steve, for allowing us the opportunity to chat here. Well, and I want to thank all you guys. You're all awesome human beings coming on my program got to know you better today got to know brandon a little better on the phone and bryce and i of course we have a history and it's always a pleasure to have you back on the program bryce you're a really cool dude and i made two new friends in alex and cody today so this was great folks so check it out we're gonna have links in the description to everything that we talked about including the websites uh also for those of you leave comments what did you think about this hypothesis what do you think if you had psychedelic experiences that were perhaps life-altering maybe talk a little bit about that also talk about people in the evangelical world. Maybe you attended Pentecostal churches and ex experienced the powerful things. Maybe tell us about those stories that you experienced as well. And also in the description, we will have links for those of you who would like to financially support us here at Mormon Book Reviews. Uh, we have Venmo, PayPal, as well as Patreons. And I want to thank all of you who are financially supporting the channel. Could not do it without you. And of course, don't forget our merch store, mormonbookreviews.com, where you can get coffee mugs, excuse me, hot chocolate mugs, ball caps, and assorted other items. And remember, the most important thing is this. All the voices of the Restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.